Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. So as the title of my presentation suggests, over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to be analyzing some of the challenges that arise when localizing puzzle games. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, so yes, my name is Diana, and I am one of the co-founders at Native Prime, which is a company specialized in game localization. Uh, I myself have been involved in, in game localization for over 20 years now. I started as a translator, then as a proofreader and editor, and then moving on into more project management tasks. And over the course of all these years, I've had the opportunity of working in numerous titles, big and small, working closely with developers and publishers. And some of those titles include uh, several strategy and puzzle games. So um, I guess needless to say, games are uh, creative content. There's no doubt about that. And most of the content that is included in these games is very creative. So when we want to localize it, we have to make sure that we convey the same emotions that were intended in the original version of the game so that players can identify themselves with the characters on the screen. They can in immerse themselves in the action. And this is what I like to call emotional localization. But in a game, there are also other types of games that provide information and instructions to the player, which of course, this kind of text can also be creative. But the goal here is to tell the player to communicate them uh, specific information so they know how to proceed, so they understand the mechanics of the game and they don't get stuck. So the emphasis here is not so much on the creativity side, it's more on the communication side. And we have to, put a lot of emphasis on accuracy. So the text that supports all the puzzle mechanics can be creative, but they have to be accurate. And this communication aspect has to be present. And more importantly, it has to be preserved. So again, for puzzles, this is what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, let me get started with a difficult uh, puzzle. Tricky Monkeys. This is a puzzle uh, from Monkey Island 2. Um, at one point in the game, uh, Guybrush, who is the protagonist, has to operate a pump with a tool. And the solution uh, already in the original version is rather tricky because first Guybrush has to go somewhere else. It has to hypnotize Jojo, the monkey, freeze him in a special position so that you can add the monkey to your inventory, and then you can use the, the, the monkey as a tool, more uh, precisely as a monkey wrench. So again, this is a very uh, complex puzzle, even in the original version, because the answer to the puzzle is a metaphor, is a play on words, it's the monkey wrench. But to make things even more complex for UK English speakers, this is even more difficult because they don't refer to this tool as a monkey wrench. They normally call it just a wrench or a spanner. Now think about other audiences, French, Italian, Spanish, where the word for monkey wrench has no monkey everywhere. So this puzzle becomes completely impossible to guess. So what I would like to stress on this talk is that those puzzles that involve words in the solution, whether those words are written on the screen or they are represented by objects, they may not work so well in all the target languages. So let's have a look at other examples from these three games that I worked on, which are Super Scribble Notes, Layton's Mystery Journey, Catriel uh, and the Millionaire's Conspiracy, and Mystery Match Village. In Mystery Match Village, some of the mechanics involve the player finding different objects that are hidden. So several words will appear written on the screen, and then you need to find the corresponding objects in the different scenarios of the game. Usually, localization teams are uh, they, they receive a long list of words with no context at all. So this lack of context makes it really hard to translate the, the terms, especially those terms that are polysemous, 
that is that have different meanings. For instance, a nail can be the nail in your finger, but it can be the nail that you smash with a hammer, or a scale can be the fish scale or the instrument that you use to measure weight. So the same with all the other objects that you can uh, that you need to find in a game. So if there is this ambiguity, if a, if a term is identified by the translators as polysemic, they will need to ask a query to the developers to figure out which of those meanings is the intended one in the game. In the game, but. Another thing could happen, and is that if the translator, because of their, uh, because of this lack of context, guesses the the meaning, what I call guesslation, this uh, can lead to potential mistakes because maybe the meaning that they guessed is not the, the right one. These are a series of examples of questions that the translation team ask uh, during the localization of Mystery Match Village. And they were taking into account the setting of the, of the game, but even taking this into account, they had many questions. Because in the game, you may need to find a magazine that is a newspaper or the part of a gun. Or maybe you need to look for a balloon, which can be very well be uh, the kid's toy or an aircraft. Actually, the team asked about the term fun, which is one of those uh, polysemic words that appear a lot and that really give us a lot of trouble. And in fact, in the game, you can find both of them, a paper hand fan and an electric fan. So when these cases arise, the developers, they need to duplicate the string and they need to clearly identify which fan is which. Otherwise, we may, uh, we, may, uh, we may end up translating these wrong and giving the player the wrong information, you know, looking for the wrong object. They might never find it because we are asking them to, to look for something that is not uh, really in the scene that they are looking for. So in this kind of, uh, of games with uh, hidden object games or when we have to look for specific uh, items in, on the screen, it's very important that the localization kit already includes all the necessary visual references for the, for the team. This way, uh, the developers are going to receive fewer queries from the translators. There will be no guessing involved whatsoever. They will know uh, exactly what every object refers to. There will be also shorter LQA times because, of course, in LQA times, if they spot a mistake, they have to fix it. It has to go back into the game. We have to check uh, that it has been fixed and so on. And ultimately, with just including visual references, which is very easy to include in a lock kit, we will have a much better final quality. As in other Layton games, in Layton's Mystery Journey, Catriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy, uh, the game is all about solving mysteries and uh, solving puzzles. The game has, uh, I think it has around 200 puzzles, some of which require the player to spell out a word as part of the answer. This game was localized into French, Italian, German, Spanish and Dutch. And one of the first tasks that we had to do was to review all the puzzles, analyze them, to see if they were fit for localization into the different languages. Um, all the puzzles had to be the same in the different locales. Uh, there was no option to have uh, different puzzles depending on the target language. So we had to make sure that the answer to the puzzles and the instructions on those puzzles per se worked well uh, in all the different target languages. So we had to review the instructions of the puzzle, the actual hints that go along with them, up to four hints per puzzle, and the final answer. And we provided the client with detailed feedback from the different teams. This is one of the puzzles in, in Leighton's Mystery Journey. Uh, there is a puzzle in which you have uh, the number 3706 uh, written with matches, and you have to take one of the matches to spell out the name of a sport. The answer to this puzzle is golf, as it is. So the first question we needed to ask ourselves, the different uh, localization teams, was uh, does the answer work in the target language? In this case, the answer was yes, because the sport golf is spelled out in the same way in other languages. So no problem, we can keep this uh, puzzle. 
In this other puzzle, uh, a dangerous animal has escaped the zoo of London and you need to find out which animal it is. You have to touch different parts of the letter of the neon that make uh, the word London to come up with the, with the name of this mysterious animal. The answer is lion. Again, remember, it's lion in English in all the target languages as well. So again, we ask ourselves the same question. Does it work in the target language? In this case, the answer is yes, but we needed to add extra information to the puzzle. Again, because the answer is going to be written in English, we need to give the player additional information so that they know that the answer they are looking for is actually written in English. So we had to add this extra information in the instructions of the puzzle. Remember that we're in London, so people speak in English. And we also had to stress this information again several times in the hints. Again, in the first hint, for instance, we added this, uh, this information again. Remember that in London they speak in English. And in the last hint, uh, first you find the letter I, now you find the letter L. And we said, remember that you're missing literally the last two letters to make it easier for the, for the player to come up with the answer. In this other puzzle, uh, you see this uh, this character with the the word wild, and uh, the puzzle is telling you that you have to move one of the sticks that make up the the word wild to turn the character into someone a little bit more easygoing. The answer to the puzzle is mild, and again I remind you that it's mild as it is in English, regardless of the target language. So. Does it work in the target language? The answer in this case is no, because unlike lion, mild is not a word so easily recognizable in English by French, Italian, German, or Spanish speakers. So what did we do in this case? We had to completely discard this uh, puzzle from the localized versions, and it had to be replaced by a, a completely different puzzle. And this was not the only one. If I remember correctly, there were at least seven other puzzles that we had to discard and they had to be replaced by something else in, in all the target territories. So uh, again, since all the puzzles had to be the same across all the locales, we had to add some explanations uh, in those puzzles where the answer had to be kept in English. And we could keep it in, in some cases, like the one I, I mentioned before with Lion. Uh, another puzzle had the answer uh, with the number six. Another one was Love. So these are words that could be easier you know, to recognize by the target audiences, by non-English speakers. But still, we had to add extra explanations to compensate uh, for this difficulty. And uh, in some cases, as I mentioned, we had to completely replace the puzzles because they were not working in the target territories. In uh, Super Scribble Notes, which is the sequel to Scribble Notes, uh, the whole gameplay is built on word glossaries. In this game, you can spawn objects by just typing the name of the object. So, for instance, you can uh, you can spawn a rabbit, a carrot, or an undead. And if the objects uh, that you have created in the game, they have intersecting properties, they can interact with each other. So in this case, the rabbit and the carrot could interact, and the rabbit would eat the carrot. Um, the gameplay in Super Scribble Notes is expanded because now you can also play with adjectives. So you can create something like a giant green flying claustrophobic rabbit. And again, based on the properties, the objects could uh, cooperate with each other. So for instance, if you spawn a vegetarian lion, uh, this lion would never eat the rabbit. The rabbit would eat the carrot, but the vegetarian lion, because you have modified the lion with the adjective vegetarian, will not eat the rabbit. At that time, the AI of the game could not have all the adjectives that exist in, in a language. I don't know how it would be nowadays. So the, adjects, uh, so the adjectives had to be divided in different categories, uh, in different groups. And the adjectives within a group will share um, a common AI, let's say. And of course, uh, we had to use lots of uh, synonyms. So the more words the game was able to understand, the more interesting the game would be uh, for the player. 
So let me show you a little bit uh, the mechanic of the game. So as I said, uh, the whole mechanic is about writing words and then you can spawn objects and you can also modify the appearance of the objects uh, so that you can interact with them. So one of the very first puzzles uh, is asking you to uh, create something, to write an object, to clean the pig. So if you type soap, you will get a soap in the game and you will be able to clean the pig. Now you get a very clean pig. Then uh, to make things more interesting, you can modify the objects that you have created. So here the game is prompting you to type an adjective to increase the pig size. The objective is that you type something like large and if you do so, your pig becomes way bigger, as you can see. The game also includes some sort of spell checker. So if you write something that the engine does not uh, recognize from the beginning, or if there are similar uh, objects in the game to give you the option to choose between them, uh, it's going to give you uh, different alternatives. So you can select the one that you mean. And also in the early stages, especially if you get too creative and what you are writing is not uh, exactly what the game wants you to, to write, to create. Like for instance, in the example below, uh, before if you type soap on a rope, it's going to guide you and it's going to give you extra information, you know, so that you know more or less what you need to do. So as I said, the whole gameplay um, is built on, on word glossaries. You can spawn everything by just typing uh, the name of an object. And the localization team, to make the game as rich as possible, it had to provide with as many adjectives as possible as well. This was the, the big difference between the previous game and uh, Super Scribble Notes. So, um, uh, one of the things that we had to do is that for every adjective, because uh, English is not a gendered uh, language, but most of the target languages, for instance, Spanish is. So nouns, they can be male or female and adjectives as well. They can have a feminine or a masculine form. So for every adjective in English, we needed to provide the feminine and the masculine form. And also, as I said before, it had to be a very rich game. So we had to provide as many uh, synonyms as possible. And as I highlight light in here for the uh, adjective dirty for instance we came up with more than 30 synonyms this gives the player the idea that they can virtually type anything they want and the game is going to react to it and also you can see here that uh, the different adjectives are divided in different categories for instance the cleanliness or the damage or the food categories and so on we also need to provide the engine with specific information about grammar rules. In this case, uh, what is the relationship between the adjective and the noun? In English, uh, you always write the adjective first and then the noun, so large pig. But for example, in Spanish, the role is the opposite, first the noun and then the adjective. And you switch it, if you switch it around, the meaning changes. Uh, and this, of course, had to be analyzed and the information had to be uh, changed depending on, on how each uh, language behaves. The game also takes into consideration that some adjectives uh, that in English are written with only one word, when translated, they need, for instance, a paraphrasis. Uh, words like moonlit, there's not a single word that translates this concept. So in Spanish, we will need a, a whole paraphrasis and also gender variations for male and female. And it will be iluminado por la luna in the masculine form or iluminada por la luna in feminine. And the same goes, for instance, with childproof, which we don't have one single word uh, that expresses this adjective or this concept. We have a prueba de niño, so an entire paraphrasis. And the same goes with other adjectives for which we needed uh, usually like two words to translate them. Again, not a single word. Uh, this is especially true in the case of most uh, adjectives that are written in, in negative form in English. So for unethical, we will need two words, no ético. For armless, we would also need uh, two words like sin brazos. Uh, so the takeaway, uh, because of course I could continue with different examples, but I think this gives you um, a, 
you know, a general idea of the challenges uh, that we usually have to face when working with uh, puzzle games that involve words is that uh, usually localization is planned uh, at the very uh, last stage of uh, production because many developers think that they need to have everything completely uh, written and locked before they can go into, into localization. But this should not be the case, uh, especially when, when localizing uh, puzzle games. First of all, because when you're working with uh, puzzle mechanics that revolve around words, uh, usually the localization stage is going to take longer than it usually takes. And most importantly, it should actually start during pre-production. This doesn't mean that we are going to start translating the game during pre-production because probably at this stage there is nothing really to translate. But what it means is that you have to involve the localization team as early as possible. And you should also consider uh, using techniques uh, such as pseudo translation to make sure that the text works well in the different target languages. You have to do testing of the puzzles as early as possible and, and probably consider that the testing is going to take longer than anticipated. And always consider that there are uh, major differences uh, from language to language. You have to consider gender, uh, which is something that doesn't uh, exist in English for, for nouns or for adjectives, but it's, it's normally the case uh, in the rest of the languages. There's also declinations, different plural forms, grammar differences, uh, you have verb conjugations, and so on. So basically, it's important not to take anything for granted. It's better to think that whatever works in English most probably will not work in your target language. As I said at the beginning, uh, when working with uh, the content of the puzzles, it's important that the focus is on, on understanding. Puzzles can be creative, but you have to make sure that the information gets across uh, your, your target audiences. And you also need to evaluate the impact on mechanics. Uh, all the changes that go through localization, all the adaptations that are needed may have an impact on the mechanics of your, of your game. And you have to measure how they affect them and always balance the difficulty. You don't want the localized game to be more difficult than the source uh, version of the game, but you don't want it to be easier because you're giving them additional information, for instance. And above all, you have to be open to changes because as we saw before, sometimes you have to completely say goodbye to some of the puzzles that you came up with. This is it from me. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for the talk. It was wonderful. Um, yeah, interesting. I'd love to see many more thinky developers doing word games. Um, <laughs> because they're difficult. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As we've seen. Uh, lots of appreciation in the chat for your talk. Um, so I've got a quick question here. Uh, this is a question from me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was wondering, have you ever encountered a situation where you've, there's been a puzzle that's been, you've been unable to translate but you also cannot remove it because it's like structurally significant for the game. Like in a Professor Layton type of situation, you can probably remove a puzzle and it won't matter too much. Yes. If mm -hmm. it happen. Right. What if it's like structurally important? Mm -hmm. um, well, not that I can think of, uh, like I didn't work myself, for mm. instance, in, in Monkey Island, uh, mm. but I mean, this is one of those cases where, you know, uh, probably, I'm pretty sure that the localization teams went back to the developer saying this is not going to work and it stayed as it is, you know, uh, right. so there are cases like that where you know that people are going to have a hard time right. uh, finding the solution because there is no way they're going to make the connection, you know, right. because the translation has no monkey, no tool, no nothing there. Yeah. yeah. So then I guess at that point, the options are like, don't localize it at all or somehow completely rewrite it, that, that bit. Of yeah, the exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so another question did come up, uh, Plush Lala here um, asking, how many languages do you work with? Uh, are most games you translated made in English originally or is there a significant number that are made in other languages first? Um, well, um, 
in, in my company, we work with all the languages. It is true that most of them are uh, originally developed in English. Some of them are developed in French and also in, in Japanese, Chinese and Korean as well. The thing is that uh, Asian languages usually go through English as a, as a pivot language. Uh, because, well, um, especially in the past, there were not so many uh, specialists that were able to translate from, say, Korean into French, Italian, Spanish directly. So this is why English is still used as a, as a pivot language mm -hmm. and then go to the rest of the languages. But yeah, we cover uh, basically all the languages that are requested nowadays. Yeah, and, and the thing is that, as I said, most of these challenges are true for all the languages other than English, you know. Uh, I mean, some, some languages like the Asian languages may not have the gender problem, but they have other problems. Um, Polish or Russian, they have like different plural forms depending on the amount of Somebody was uh, just mentioning items. that in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So every language has their difficulties, but the takeaway is that they are not, you know, what works in English mm -hmm. most probably will not work in the rest of the languages. Yeah, that's why testing and early testing is so important. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks for the answer. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, folks, we're just going to switch over to the